it not gonna will it not really pick me up? No, it's working. Okay. All right, and you're on? All right. This is uh home wiring. Um there's probably a lot of stuff we'd cover, so this is the, the first of of several in our series of home wiring. Um all right, before we go on actually before we get to the the, the questions and we'll talk over wire in three ways and some of the things people do wrong and how to avoid it. Um, I want to start with just a basic electricity overview, how we get power. And that starts with two pretty cool things. If, if this is a copper wire, um, everybody knows magnets don't work with aluminum, don't work with copper, magnet interacts with steel. So you think of a magnet and steel as, as its primary, they depend on each other. Um, Magnets interact with copper way cooler than they do with steel. <coughs> if we put a, uh, a sensitive voltmeter, this has indicators, we attach a copper wire to it and uh, take a magnet and, and run it down past this wire, we'll get the tiniest little blip here. It's, it, it, it shifts the electrons just the smallest amount and go up, it shifts them the other direction. So this guy's just gonna barely blip one way, a little bit the other way, increase the size of the magnet, we can get it to move a little farther, increase the speed that you're passing by here, almost like you're, you're hitting it, you can get it to move farther. The best way to increase it is take that wire, the same wire, but now when you run that magnet down past there, you just ran it past there that many times. Big powerful magnet moving quick going past a bunch of them. Now you're really starting to make voltage. Is <laughs> compounded? Um, not necessarily compounded, but you're taking that magnetic field and you're hitting that wire that many times. So, so you're, you're starting to maintain something. <clears throat> um, that's far as, as I want to go with that one. <clears throat> Okay, if we take a battery, um, and let's take that out. Well, even, even just the wire by itself, there's already a magnetic field just because of this voltage. Can you guys see anything? I didn't think of that. Um, but again, same idea. You take and coil that wire up. Now we've created a much stronger magnetic field. And then you go a step further and, and run a nail through here, run a piece of iron through the center of that, and now you've created a decent little electromagnet. Even with just a, a AA battery, you, you pick up a paper clip, but, but you've got a magnet, magnetic field. This is an electromagnet. <laughs> so basically what we've got is a magnet plus copper windings equals voltage and a voltage plus copper windings equals a magnet and and these two things for whatever reason that works that that is our electricity uh, the inside of electric motor is copper windings and magnets you would know that because anybody you probably recycle them uh, so you take uh, take an electric motor and put voltage on here, you're going to spin the shaft. Just like this, you go the other direction, you manually spin this shaft, you're going to create voltage. And that's really, that's, that's a whole power plant. You got, I'm not going to draw a generator here, generator. Little, little uh, residential generator at a construction site. Gas motor spinning, or gas engine spinning an electric motor. And then you run the wires out to your saw, and and you've got a, a basic power distribution system. You got the power plant, the transmission, and then the end user. <clears throat> Make sure I'm not getting off topic. Okay. So. How do power plants create power? 
What are the main ways that we that we create power? Somebody's got to have something. Okay. Yep. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Um, this, all other than right here, this this guy, this little two percent, that's solar. It's it's hardly a blip. And we got uh, water, hydro, a little more than that. That would be dams and things. Uh, this is wind. And then that uh, nuclear and coal, each are the same, about 20%. All the rest of this is natural gas. 40% is natural gas, and 80% is heating water, makes steam, steam drives the turbine, which is, is just a super electric motor. And there are more things involved. There's um, <coughs> commutators and, and they're, they're not, you can't just take any motor and, and call it an a efficient generator, but they're basically the same thing. Well, dams are too. <coughs> what is? Water spinning and turbine. Exactly. It, wind and hydro, they're still just spinning electric motors. All of these are spinning electric motors. So all of our power comes just like generator, regardless of what you're using, you can pedal it, you know. You, you're spinning a motor, that's our power. And even on a, an enormous scale, that's all of our power. Um, so, if we look at, um, let me draw a little power plant. Okay, there's some cooling towers. There's a power plant, and it's driving this city. And another power plant, and this city. So this power plant has transmission lines, and they're running all over this city, and some outliers, and they're covering this guy. This guy's got all of it. You've got that spread across, and what happens now is this power plant has to be big enough to feed this city on its worst case scenario. On the hottest days of the year when the plants are all running and all the machines are going, worst case scenario, this guy has to be able to keep up with it. And, and, and it was built to keep up with it. But then the city grows, and this guy is built to keep up with the size of it, but its city grows. And so now you start getting to where each of these guys has to, we, we need another plant, or we've got to make this guy bigger, or what they did, is say, what if your system tied into our system, and, and that ties into this guy, and that ties, get, ties into that guy, even though this power plant does have its customers, they're all tied together. The transmission system in North America, is all, it's Canada, North America, or Canada, the US. Um, I'm gonna forget now. I think five million miles of distribution lines, maybe half a million miles of transmission lines, um, it's, it's considered or it's referred to as the biggest machine on the planet because it's all one interconnected thing. So all of these different power plants, they're spitting up power and kicking it onto this line and probably on a daily average, they can produce twice what the city needs or something. And when they're kicking out more than their city needs, they're selling it and when, they're, when their customers need more than they're able to produce, then they're buying it. So the whole thing, even though when we did uh, Gateway, we were Conexus, we did Encore, we were XL, and they're two different power companies, it's, it's one system, it's all one huge transmission line. <coughs> um, all right, now. Can I ask you a question on that question? Yeah. What, if, what if there's more production than demand? The power they they kick on it, no storage. They just kick on more generators. So even though they're they're producing a lot of steam, maybe they have the first four turbines running, and uh, four more that they kick on when they need to. Okay. Yeah. Um, and dams do that. They'll let water just flow by and and grab what they need to. Um, <coughs> so let's say apart from all of that. Um, this guy 
has a new development and there's a hundred homes that they need to send power to and let's figure that they're going to try to be ready for 100 amps at every house. Um, we're still going to feed those with 200 amp services but realistically 70 amps maybe is is a high load for one of those houses. So they're trying to get 100 amps to 100 houses. That's 10,000 amps. That's a lot of amps. I did the math on that. That's 10,000 amps is a wire 23 inches in diameter. <laughs> so, and that's that's if you're gonna you're plugging it in here and you're using it here. That's 10 foot, 23 inches. You're trying to get from this power plant 15 miles out to where these guys are. Now you got an unbelievable wire, and that's one of the wires. And we sent them 240 volts plus they're neutral. So it's impossibly heavy and possibly expensive. <coughs> That's where Ohm's Law comes into play. Who knows Ohm's Law other than Luke? V equals IR? Uh, it, that is part of it. Um, uh, but this is the part that uh, I care about right now. <coughs> this, this does work into there. And, and V is volts and E is volts. So it would be written like this. Um, but we're not, gonna, we're not gonna go into resistance. P is power. We call that watts. I, I think is maybe induced current. I forget what I stands for. Um, but more commonly, we call it amps. And E is, I believe, energy and we know it as volts. So day-to-day -day use, this is how we use it. Watts equals amps times volts. Um, and what that equals, any, you, watts divided by volts equals amps. Watts divided by amps equals volts. Through this, you can figure out the other ones. If we're doing 10,000 amps and we're sending 240 volts to each of those customers, that is 2.4 million watts. So, if we had to send it um, at 240 volts, this is insane, but according to this, we can just alter that and take this number way down. We jack this number way up, we can bring this number way down and we'll still equal the same thing. So if we take 2.4 million, here, million watts, and we raise our volts up from 120 to 100, 120,000, uh, what is that, 20? Sorry, I don't have that written down. Now we're at 20 amps, and their, their transmission lines that are up at 300 and some thousand volts. So here, um, I'll just write watts, and volts. So now this is, we're still getting out to these houses, but now we only have to send a wire big enough for 20 amps. And voltage drop comes into an issue, you run them more than I do now, after 150 feet, is it already something that the wire starts going up from? Yeah, I'd say 150. So, I mean, anybody that's plugged two extension cords in and still tried to run their, their worm drive saw or something, you, you can just hear it running different. You can already tell that you're, you've reduced your volts. So, especially as you start trying to really cover some distance, the only way to do that is by the fact that we can raise voltage way up. Okay? <coughs> Am I going too fast? Okay, dumb question. Yeah. Difference between watts, amps, volts. Um, <coughs> they're, I, I think all three are last names and it's just different ways of looking at it and they're, they all are very much related to, the, to each other. Okay. It's basically somebody discovering a new way to, to, to 
measure this piece and throw in their name on it. But this is current. This is the amount running through there. If you look at it like water, um, you're sending the same water through and you're maybe even sending, well, um, think of current as the amount of that water that's actually going through and you can even then kind of look at resistance as, as confining that water. Um, otherwise they, they just relate like this. It's more mathematical than really anything else. Would voltage but, be speed in that analogy then? <coughs> pressure. Know, like Maybe. How, pressure here, like how does voltage not affect wire thickness? Why can they run small wires with high voltage? <coughs> Like what you're saying with speed, you can have a, a, it's a thin pipe, a high pressure line. Right, it's just okay. shooting through. The watts at the end is how much water you can do. Big old pipe and really slow, and you get the same as a smaller pipe, but going way faster. You're sure. getting the same gallons per minute. The only difference is as that as the voltage climbs, then its ability. Oh, I erased the resistance. Its ability to jump through that resistance is increased. Sure. Um, and so that's why we can stand right next to something energized and it's not going to hit you until you touch it but you get too close to a power line and it's going to jump to you because even though there's resistance and there's a big gap it, it wants to get there so badly sure. but that's just in the insulation of it or the keeping it separate from everything else <clears throat> all right how do we get to simply change that voltage if we uh, I'll call this primary just like our nail before we're creating a magnetic field right there and just like when we hit the wire with a magnet and created voltage over here. This guy wants to pull off of this magnetic field. We take this magnet, that's the outside, put a magnetic field on here, run that right through here, we're getting this guy to jump. Now what this doesn't illustrate is when we looked at the magnet at the very beginning, when you go past it, you do get it to jump. If you just hold it there, it, all you did is jump it. If you stop moving, it, you don't have voltage there anymore. So yes, you might have a very strong magnetic field right here. You don't have any power here if you can't keep whipping it past this. Okay, so we got voltage going in there, coming out here. If this was battery, if this was a direct current, all it's gonna do is this one thing. It creates a magnetic field, we got nothing over here. We'd have to sit there going on and off with it maybe to get anything to happen here. Alternating current, power goes this way, then it goes this way, then it goes this way. It's a magnetic field going this way, then it's going this way, then it's going that way. So it's passing the wire, passing the wire, passing the wire. How many times does AC change direction in this country? How often? Does anybody know what that is? 60 times a second. We call that hertz. I think in Europe it's 50. Um, 60 times a second, this is going from, from pushing to pulling. Okay, this magnetic field keeps going back and forth. So we're whipping past these, this coil very quickly, very consistently. We've got a very consistent voltage coming out of here. And right now, if we've got equal number of windings on both sides, we've, we've just got an isolation transformer or a one-to-one -one transformer. And those are used from time to time because the power we're sending in is the same power we're bringing out, but it's isolated. That is not very helpful for us. So we take and grab hold of this magnetic field with a lot more windings. So now we got fewer windings going in, a lot more windings coming up. So this would be a step up transformer. You can feed this side and come out this side, you'd have a step down transformer. 
Okay, and you'll you'll see those monsters next to power well all over the place. They'll have switch yards, but uh, these big alien looking things that have wires hanging all off them. These are monster transformers stepping up the power that they're originally creating. I think they all create power at 12, 13,000 volts. Um, and they get tuned, they, they get lined up so their, their, their power is ready to jump on the interstate. And then they step it up and throw it onto the transmission lines that run all over the place. And then at the other end, they step it down and goes on to dis distribution lines. The transmission lines that are up at 150,000, 300,000 volts, those are off in the country, way up in the air, very hard to accidentally get too close to one of those. So that's, that's the interstate where you're, you're really flying. They step it down to distribution lines run through neighborhoods. So just like an interstate, now we got slower speed, um, drop that down to something like 12,000 volts. And then all over the place under the transmission lines, you'll see the transformer sitting up there. That guy's actually dropping it down to the 120, 240 that's going to your house. So that's how we're getting power all over the place. Step it up and step it down just so that we can, we can transport it in a way that actually works. And this was the big fight that uh, Tesla and Westinghouse had, or Edison had, because Edison wanted DC and Tesla wanted AC. And AC you can, you can get all over the place and DC you can't, you can't transform DC. So that was the battle and it, it had to go AC. There's no way to do DC like that. So does that mean that it's at that 2.4 million watts or whatever everywhere? It's always that high of power, just different voltages? Um, this would be just megawatts coming out of every different power plant, way higher than this. So where would they, and like how would they actually step down the full power <coughs> the wattage rather than just the voltage? You're, you're not stepping power, watts up and down. That only has to do with the power that you're consuming. You're just stepping voltage up and down. So the voltage plus how much you're using of it is the wattage, but this is the power you're actually consuming. So this doesn't, this gets stepped up and down because this does, but really that's, that's a symptom. We're stepping voltage up or down. Okay. An interesting fact with that, um, the electrons move at like the speed of light. So every, I mean, the power that we have on right here, it's being created somewhere in a power plant this second. It's not stored, it doesn't go into anything. They're making what we're using all the time. Which is hard, that's, that's why the, the cities have trouble then if they're not interconnected because there's no warning. It doesn't just start to, to bleed down your supply and you better kick another line on. Just like when you fire up a couple saws on a small generator and you just shut the generator down, they, they're creating what you need right then with no warning. So that's getting better now with smart devices everywhere. They actually can communicate and say, here's what we need to do. And so some of that's getting solved that way. Um, I don't know if there's anything else I wanted to say with this. Okay, I think I'm mostly done drawing. Um, so, as we get over to your actual house and actual problems you may face, um, the first stop power makes is your meter box on the outside of your house. Here, I'll just draw it sideways. Um, that's either underground or overhead with a masthead. If, if this is disconnected, your whole house is dead. So depending on what you're doing and how unsafe you maybe feel, when, when we go to, to swap somebody's panel out in their basement or garage, these guys are tied right together, we pull the meter and then everything here is dead. We can take the lines right off the meter, replace those, take this from 100 amp to 200 amp, replace all of this. There's no power going anywhere after the meter. When you get above probably 400 amps, then you don't pull the meter. Because this, the power is literally running into the meter and back out of the, well, not up there. 
back out of the meter. Um, so when you, when you separate it, you've broken that circuit. Building like this, 4,000 amps, that, that'd be a really big meter. So then it's just CTs, which is the same principle, little um, coil magnets growing around the wire, just the current's going through and it's reading that magnetic field. So it's going through heavy duty stuff that can take 4,000 amps, um, but you, you can't just pull it. At your house, you can pull the meter and everything past the meter is dead. Um, probably swapping out your panel. You guys would still want to bring in an actual electrician. So for the most part, you can just know that when you shut your main off, everything past the main is dead. <coughs> oh, sorry. This was one electrician's head laying around. Um, this is kind of confusing because it looks like the wires all tie in, but these guys are going out here feeding a sub panel. This was the line in. So with this off, I could get shocked in here, but apart from these two connections right there, everything in here you can touch at that point. Okay, so if in doubt, if you've got something you want to do in here and you, you don't really feel safe about it, just shut the whole thing down. If you have this on and you're trying to deal with just this, but you touch anything here or have a screw drop and hit anything, these are, these are all live and between two of them like that is 240 volt. So that'll, you'll feel that. <laughs> um, but if, if, if you're not grounded, you're not gonna feel anything. Rubber boots like this, I could do that with it live. Spe a wooden floor like this, there's no way I'm grounded right now. If I do this, then I'm grounded. So when we go to um, swap out a panel in somebody's house, we go up on the roof and cut the wires. Those are live coming right from the power company. We're standing on a wooden roof in boots. Um, there's metal um, shaft. What do you call that? Main. What did, what did you say? I can't think of the name. Um, mast. Mast. What did I call it? Shaft. It's kind of a shaft. Um, but with a, with a metal mast like that, um, I have gotten hit that way where you, you're trying to be safe and not touch anything and you, you find your side of your arm or hit it there because that's grounded. Um, but otherwise, you, you have to complete the circuit and if it can't go through you, then you can't get shocked. Doesn't matter what's there. <coughs> um, why don't we stick with panels for a minute? <coughs> um, probably everybody that doesn't have a, a house built in the last maybe decade, if you go in your panel, you're going to see more than just black and white. Um, these guys are, are typically both black and maybe going out to a sub panel, you'll, you'll see a, a couple. Um, but out of all your branch circuit wiring, something to look for is that you probably have more than just black. If you have more than just black wires, there's a good chance that they ran a, a multi-circuit. Here, I don't have black. Um, so you'd have two. Oh. Well, and I guess that doesn't really matter because I can't draw white. So here, my red's going to be white. So coming down out of the top, out of a, a Romex or a pipe conduit, whatever, you've got a white wire and, and a black and another color. If you've got a couple whites and a, and a couple that aren't white, white, white is always neutral. Okay, greens are always grounds. So whatever you already know from working in your car, it's not the same in a house. Green has to be ground. Nobody could color one of these green and just pull it for a hot. Okay, so your whites are always neutral, greens are always ground. Anything else, the code doesn't really specify. We have rules of thumbs, black, red, blue for, for 120 volt, brown, orange, yellow for 277, 480, but they're just rules. People could run all pink and nothing is illegal about that. So in your house um, forever, we ran just like this, multi-wire circuits, two hots sharing one neutral. 
it's one less wire. We can take two circuits up and hit a couple bedrooms with one and the living room and dining room lighting with the other and we ran one home run. <coughs> the problem, there's a few problems with this. Um, and when you say home run, you're talking back to the box. Back to the box. Those two wires land, one's on one circuit, one's on the other. Okay? Um, and the way that works, I'll, I'll stay consistent here. Here's, here's my black circuit sine wave, and then my other one's blue. And they're out of phase with each other. Okay, we're not going to go deep into that, mostly because I'm not smart enough. Um, but they can share one neutral back. Okay, the neutral only carries the unbalanced load. So if, if this guy's drawn 15 and this guy's drawn 12, there's only three amps on this neutral. It only carries the unbalanced load. What happens though, I mean this works because they're on two different phases. But a homeowner works in their panel and then when they're done, they do this. And I don't know if you can tell right here, all of, every other row, that's one phase. Okay, from this side, every other line is this phase. So the top row is A, next row is B, third row is A again, B. So anywhere down here, you can click on the two, you're on both phases. It's not left side is A and right side is B, because then you couldn't do something like this. You don't have two hots over here. But by going every other, anywhere you put this, you'll be on both. Okay, so when these two are side by side, I don't know which one is A, which one is B, but I know one's on one and one's on the other. Now I know these two are on the same one, regardless of if it's A or B, they're both on the same one. So now, if I'm running 15 amps through this and 12 amps through this, rather than the neutral just trying to carry that unbalanced three amps, now I'm trying to run 27 amps through this neutral. And if they're on 15 amp breakers, if, if this was only a, a number 14 wire and it's rated for 15 amps and I'm trying to run 27 through it, I'm going to start a house fire. And, and they really do. And I've been to those where I have to go in after the fact and and look at things and try to, I mean, they know it's electrical, but was it manufacturer error? Was it a homeowner mistake? How did it happen? And I can go down and say, well, you got these two and they're sharing a neutral and those two are sharing a neutral. So right away we've got some obvious signs of, of where that house fire came from. So that's a big, that's something even now, even though you haven't yet messed in your panel, you don't know that the elect, last electrician did it right and you don't know that the last homeowner didn't mess, in the, mess with it, I would still take and look in your panel and look for, look for anything other than just black and white. And you see a couple of them coming from here and there's a few different colors, one neutral, a couple different hots, follow those guys down and see that they don't come in on, on separate phases. If they do, fix that. Pull the, pull the one off and get that next to it. Don't just get it so that you moved it from here to here and now they're, they're proper. Get them next to it. And the code says now they have to be handle tied even so that somebody can't accidentally do that. So that's a mistake that can happen. Um, so each breaker would let it suck 15 amps. You have a, like, it could yeah. have 30 and the wire is only rated for. Yep. Okay. <coughs> so what's an instance where that would, where you have to have them handled together? Anytime you have a multi conductor circuit where you have more than one hot sharing a neutral then they have to be tied together. This, um, this is essentially that. They're sending a couple hots out with one neutral, um, but this is a sub panel. This is something that actually acquires 240 volt. So these are, are leaving in the same spot where, where these guys, they're, they're going to totally separate locations. They, they don't, other than how they tie together in a panel, they're not part of each other. It's legal and it's safe if it's done right. Um, but now, maybe even the last decade, um, everything needs its own, neut own neutral. So just too many times things starting on fire. So they've, they started by saying tie everything together and now pull, pull a separate neutral for everything. Another problem that we would run into, uh, if, if you have any of this going on, um, this guy goes out to your TV. And, well that shouldn't be, this guy 
goes out to your box fan. And they're sharing a neutral. So the wires aren't all big and separate, but for the trying to teach this, I'm drawing them all separate like that. This is fine. We got 120 going right there, 120 going right here. Everything works fine. This gets broken because you're messing around in the panel and you thought you were unscrewing the right one, but you actually unscrewed the wrong one and pulled it out. So for just a second, this guy got broken or a wire nut came off and it's been broken off for a little bit now. This guy's always got power. It's just waiting for you to hit the remote, but it's, it's got power going to it already. Somebody turns this fan on. We're not sending power back anymore. We're sending 120 volts down to here. It can't go back. This guy's got 120, a different 120, a different phase coming through here. Now we've just sent 240 volts to this and 240 volts to this. And they're both smoked. And that happens a ton. There was one business where we would go down almost weekly and they'd say that computer broke, that computer broke. It had plug mold all through a huge call center and through the bottom of the plug mold everywhere. They'd just snap together like this. Somebody kick a little bit and we'd break a neutral, blow all those computers up. And every time I would take and I'd say you gotta talk to the manufacturer of this. So here's another reason why this is just bad. So it's, it's less wires. Electricians must prefer to do it this way. Um, but that's another thing that can happen to you as the user if you've got multi-wire circuits. <laughs> so it's a three-wire with a ground that's um, Versus a wire with a ground? If you're talking Romex, um, then yeah, you'd have black, red, white, and a ground. So the black would be one power and the red would be, and then yep. the neutral would be sharing. Yep. Um, but it, this could also be in a conduit running around in your garage. It could be in, in flex running around through your basement. So it doesn't have to be Romex. Um, and especially when, I mean, Romex is real easy to see then. You can, you can just follow those down. But in conduit, flex conduit, um, I would look into it. Um, as far as swapping out a breaker, I don't think there's anything much more to tell you there. They, in some manner, they grab this side and then they just push on. Residential, they don't screw on, they all just push on. Um, <clears throat> arc faults. Um, for a little bit, arc faults were required just in bedrooms. Then they said bedrooms and living rooms maybe. And, and now, everything, your dishwasher, everything is arc faulted. I think the bathroom is currently the only thing in garage, right? Anything other than bathroom and garage of 120 volt? Um, no, I think and the next code comes out, I'm sure they'll say those two. And, and at that point, things might get cheaper because maybe they'll put an arc fault just on the main. Um, although, then anything goes wrong anywhere, your whole house goes down. Um, arc faults, as they're requiring them more, they're making them more, they're getting better at them so they don't trip as easily as they used to. <coughs> What an arc fault does that's very different from a GFI, they both will have test reset buttons on them and they seem like they're the same thing. And a lot of breakers, in fact, most of the ones we use here are combos, right? GFI arc fault combos. Yeah. Um, an arc fault, there's, the breaker it itself is looking for the very specific, like electrical signature what that looks like. You know like a sonar guy that, that starts to be able to tell that's a whale just because of the way it looks. It has nothing to do with what he's actually hearing. The, the arc fault is, is looking for that exact little sine, not sine wave, the electrical signature. And when it resembles that, it says that's not a motor, that's not a compressor that kicked on, that's a dangerous arc. And it shuts that breaker down for it. So you got a cord that's, that's uh, got a, a weak part in it. Um, those are the arcs that it's trying to protect against. Those are the, the bedroom fires. So that's what an arc fault does. A GFI um, actually measures the power, uh, measures the power that's leaving on the hot, and it measures the power that's coming back in the neutral, and vice versa as it's alternating back and forth. It's measuring those two, um, and sometimes it'll just measure the neutral because the neutral carries the unbalanced load. So it's just looking for anything, anything that doesn't balance. 
And as soon as there's an unbalance, that's saying something left here that didn't come back here. That's going through a person. That's doing something it's not supposed to do, and it shuts it off like that in that like be fractions of a millisecond. But it you have to complete a circuit, so it, it has to it has to be going through it. The same amount coming through it is going back, so it's still going to read the same. So it would be taking amperage, not voltage, or like how does that work? Go back, go back to water and imagine or hydraulics. Yes, you're you're using that to spin the motor, but then you're not spraying it out. Sure. It's okay. it's still returning. You're still you're using it, but everything coming out is going back. So it's just measuring for anything difference. And so what that's doing is any place that you could be grounded, like like again, if I'm standing in a wooden floor and I touch the wrong thing, I'm not getting shocked. But in a basement or a garage, where it's a cement floor, very oops, that's my microphone. Um, place like that, damp, very good ground. You're maybe in damp socks or barefoot. You can be grounded. Your kitchen with with uh, well, we used to use copper plumbing. Now with everything going PEX, it's a little hard to get shocked in a kitchen. Um, but places like that, you've got metal faucets, you've got tile floors, places where you can be grounded, then you touch something now and you're barefoot, it is going through you. So in those locations, GFIs are required. Um, and those keep expanding out too, and pretty soon every, every place in the house will need a GFI as well. <laughs> um, how are we on time? Um, I don't know that I'll get to the end and just have a question time, so just interrupt me if, if there's something specific you want to ask about. Here's a GFI. Um, I could send a couple of them around. Oh, I want to talk about three ways too. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the GFI, you have to wire the line side. Um, let me draw a big old GFI. And here's the yoke. Okay, see, so you, you plug it in over here. Like that. Um, inside here is, is the part of it that's actually measuring power coming in and going out and doing its job. Um, you'll see on the, on the GFI that it says line and load. And they come out of the box with tape across the load side. So if you're only going to do one set of wires, you're kind of forced to put them on the line side. You default to that. So if, if this is load down here, these are taped off. Okay. So power is going into the line side. And then it's monitoring power in and out. And power's going out on the front of the GFI. You can plug in anywhere and you're forced through here. You can also jump right in here. This is out the load side. It's just like plugging into it now, but you're tying wires onto it. So if you're gonna do a, a shop in your basement and you've got outlets all through here, and legally every one of those has to be GFI protected, um, but also just practically, you want to have machines in front of these on your workbench and you don't want to dig behind these. So you have to GFI protect them, um, but you don't want to put in 10 different GFIs, uh, plus you don't want to have to dig behind them to, to reset it if there's an issue. So you put your GFI over here, maybe by the light switch, and your line's coming into here. You come out with all of these, on the load side of that outlet. So all of these are now GFI protected. It's just like if you plugged into the front of it and ran power strips all around there. They're all coming on the load side. I've seen a lot of nodding. I think everybody knew that. Another way you can use a GFI. <coughs> For anybody that's got a house this old. This doesn't have a ground. And yes, you can do this. And now you're grounded. <laughs> but you're not grounded, obviously. So this isn't grounded, <coughs> and sometimes I've been in situations where you, you pull this out because a homeowner's tired of dealing with this and tired of dealing with these, and they just want regular outlets in there. You pull it out, and the box is grounded. You do have ground going to it. They just put these in, and you can get away with 
with taking the tail off of things, getting them grounded, putting regular outlets in. Usually, if they have this, it's because there's no ground there. Doesn't matter that it's a metal box, there's a, a white and a black wire or even knob and tube that there's no ground there. In that case, you can use a GFI and every GFI comes with stickers like this and you'll see no equipment ground. There's, some of the stickers say GFI protected and on outlets like this, you can throw those on there, electricians are supposed to, that's saying, yes, this isn't a GFI, it's GFI protected. If you're using it for these, you throw outlets all over the place, just, just like this. You go to, to one of them, the first one in the line, put a GFI in there. Now run to all the other outlets and go ahead and put three regular, regular outlets in there. And so you're attaching grounds everywhere, but it goes back to here and it goes to nothing. And on each of those, then you put no equipment ground. So you're not actually grounded. But you can't get hurt because of the same principle this is doing. It's still measuring power going out in the hot, coming back in the neutral. If it's trying to go anywhere else, you're still not going to get hit. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter that it's leaking out to the metal lamp and now the whole shell is energized and you, you touch that and you're on a cement floor, it's trying to go through you. This is still going to shut it off immediately. If it's grounded and it's leaking out to the shell of it, it's going to trip out. You're going to, it's going to trip a breaker. So having everything grounded keeps it all in the same plane and you can't, you're not the guy to create that link. Um, but if you don't have a ground, the only way you're, you're really safe is to GFI protect everything. Um, here. Well, I'm going to need space for three ways. Okay, who's ever experienced a uh, a light switch where two switches are supposed to turn a light on and they do as long as the one at the top of the stairs is in the on position then the bottom one works but if the top one goes off nothing works anymore okay that's because people go to switches and they pull the wires off put a different switch and everything works just fine so you think I'm an electrician now you go to three-way pull the wires off buy a different one put them all back on any which way and it doesn't work with a three-way <coughs> Okay, they're not that hard to diagnose for electricians, but they understand how they work. <clears throat> First, let's start with just a, a basic circuit. There's a hot and a neutral. And a switch. Put it together, lights on, pull it apart, lights off. Okay, now... Same thing. We tie these guys together, the lights on, open them up, lights off. These two screws are these two screws. Okay? These are the commons. Here, I don't need to hold this. You'll see on the back, one screw's a different color, and it's and it says very small common on there. Way a three-way works is the other two screws have to get connected together. Doesn't matter which wire is which. They just have to get connected to the other side. So what this is doing is providing two options to get over there. And that switch gets to, has two options to pick from. So if it's on and this guy wants it off, put it on the other option, it's off. If it's off and this guy wants it on, switch it to the other side and it's on. That's, that's the whole mystery in a three-way switch. It's just sending these two travelers across and, and both sides can grab either one. Can you draw the little bridges just for help? Little, like the, the oh, switch yep. Yeah. So this guy is choosing between those two and this guy is choosing between those two. So if this is like that, it's on, that's off. This guy goes down, or that guy goes up. Oh, I forgot I crossed these, so I'm saying things backwards. Um, but the principle is the same. Even with the four-way switch, all that's doing, it, well, better keep it in blue since they're all travelers. Four-way is just either saying, we'll keep it like that, or we'll cross it. But every different switch, you can have any number of four-way switches. All they're doing is switching between 
train tracks. <coughs> that is how they have to be wired today. So in this building, all the three ways, we don't have four ways, we don't even have very many three ways. Well, and actually the switches are getting pretty smart to where they just tell the switch what they want it to do. This is the current legal way to wire a three-way, okay? So this is a, a switch box. I need the neutral, that's why the box is, is a little bit tall. Um, so we got a, a 14-2 right here going into this switch. We got a 14-2 coming out of this switch. And between them, we've got a 14-3. We're carrying the neutral over to there. That is not probably what is in your house. It gets a little more confusing <clears throat> because, again, electricians go with what's the least amount of material and least amount of work. So, um, let's draw a couple three ways. <clears throat> If, if the power is coming in on this side and the light is down here, it really might be just like that in your house. But that's not always the way. The light is maybe back here. Boy, that got weird. Okay. Light's way back here. If power was coming from that side, it would still flow nicely. But if power is coming from over here, then in this building, if we were using smart switches, we would have to go to here all the way across to here, all the way back up and across the living room over to where this light actually is. It's a lot of extra wire, extra work. So up until the code changed, <coughs> power would have come in here. So here's, here's my hot and my neutral. Okay, so they come into this box and I don't need the neutral down there. I just need the neutral to the light. So that's going to go up to the light. This is just on a wire nut. It's not one of my three screws. Here's my two travelers going to the, to the switch at the bottom of the stairs or something. And now i got to get that to here. That's not in there. So this third wire comes back and goes up here. So it's, it's still all the same as what we drew before. Um, you got a 14-2 and a 14-2 here, and a 14-3. What we don't have down here now is a neutral. <coughs> it doesn't need a neutral. But then they started making switches that have occupancy sensors and timers and digital and, and, and everything else that need, that the switch itself uses power. Right now we don't, have, we don't have a complete circuit. We don't have a neutral down here. We don't have a way to use power. We're just sending power through this. To use power, we've got to have the other side. So to make this still work as an occupancy sensor, something that requires power, they use the ground. And the grounds, grounds and neutrals, well, this, this isn't. Uh, but if this is the main panel, grounds and neutrals are all in the same bus. They all go together, they join together. So ground works fine as a neutral, um, but you're not supposed to put power on that ground because you, that's part of your ground system. If you start introducing power there and anything opens up, you're energizing all these things that shouldn't be. But that's the only way to make that device work. So as they're making those devices, then they finally said, we got to change this and force electricians to get neutrals to all switches. So that if a, a switch that requires power gets put in, it has a neutral source. So this is called a dead end three way. Very, very common in your, in your house. There's definitely dead end three ways. Um, again, all of the mystery is taken out as soon as you know which is the common. If you're ever swapping a switch out, pull it out. You can usually tell um, when electricians are done and they're ready to, to finish with, the, with a box, they take and they wrap their common around there. So there's three wires sticking out. Here's your three wires. The common is the one that wraps around the two wires. It's just kind of an industry standard. If that isn't the case, but everything worked just fine, as you pull it off, look at the back. Look for the screw that's a different color, the one that says common. Wrap it around the other two or write common on it so that you know which one's your common. The other two don't matter. You're not going to screw the switch up. <clears throat> if you came in there later because your brother-in-law took this all apart and now you're just there to try to say, I think I know how to do a three-way, you're just trying to see which side has power. When all the switches are out, if, if 
All of these came off of everything right now, and you just have three, three wires sitting here, because the switch is gone, and three wires sitting there. None of this is connected. Everything down here is dead. You check with all those wires, everything's dead. So you know power didn't come in there. You check with all of these, you got one wire that's hot. So you just find your common, one of them. Tie it onto one of these. One of these just became hot. So now you know that was one of your travelers. Switch it to another wire. The other one just became hot. That's your other traveler. So now you know your other common. All you need to do is find your two commons. Process of elimination, not too hard to do if you know what you're looking for. One other variation <coughs> that uh, before my time, um, what are those buildings? Mill ponds. All the mill pond buildings in Forest Lake that we own. Legally, this wasn't illegal wiring. It's, it's illegal to do it today. Um, but they had kind of like we have here and power's coming in from this side. So here's my neutral. Neutral's got to get to the light. These all went up to the light, up to this junction box. And this side did the same thing. Okay. I'm going to draw that up the other side, make it a little easier to see later. So all of these, all six of these wires are just coming into that light box. These guys are tying together. That's going to the light, that's going to the light. So you can see how it works. But you've got the whole thing drawn up right now. When you're just there and you've pulled this open and it's a bunch of wires, the mess is that in this 14.2, in this 14.2, you've got a black and a white. Okay, it makes sense since you're sending a neutral up there to keep this guy white. This is your other two, so this is, call that black and red. And then this guy, just because it's what you want to see going to your light, is probably the black wire. So these two are just the white and the red. And that's all fine and legal, and you're using a white as a, as a traveler. But now you've got a black and a red. This red can go to red. This black is wire united right to a, to a white. So this black and white go to the light, and this black and white go to each other. That looks like a mess, and especially if you've already had a maintenance guy go in there and pull some things apart and say, I just can't figure this out, how to put it back together. That's kind of a nightmare. And we do run into that. So you may have that in your home where it's, it's, it's probably one of those three options. Um, but I don't know. I've maybe just made things more confusing than they need to be. Can I consider a California three-way? No, California three-way does it with, with just two wires um, and I think a switch neutral. I don't know, I looked it up once, but uh, it's something you should never do. Yeah. It's just an old kind of it's farmer's hack. Neutral. That's why it's super legal I think California stoners came up with it. <laughs> um, what haven't we covered? I think that's the end of the list of things that I was trying to get to, 459. Uh, sorry if I just talked all the time. Do you guys have questions that you wanted to ask and I didn't leave time for? On that freeway, if you have one that's not working, that has, you have to have the one switch on to make the other <coughs> one work? Is it just the common? Somebody, match? one of those wires just went to the wrong spot. You just have to figure out which one it is and swap it. Yep. Way easier with a voltmeter and even easier with a volt tick because that picks up magnetic fields, which we all learned about. Um, you can, uh, with a good one, even with all the wires still connected, um, you can just touch the different screws with it and see which one's hot. Um, sometimes you need to actually be holding the wire to, to kind of take off any just induced current, any weak magnetic field, because as we learned, when wires are running next to each other, one's got a magnetic field but copper running next to it, it's picking up that magnetic field. So with a, with a crappier kind of volt tick, they all look like they're hot. Um, probably a little easier 
to just disconnect the wires and then put a Voltic on each of them and find the hot one. So back to power transmission from the beginning, like on a power line, there's only like a foot or two between those. <coughs> Why wouldn't that want to jump to each other? Um, Is that on a all hot? What kind of a power line? You're talking a distribution line? Yeah, like out in the middle of Montana, big old... Transmission lines, those right. are maybe six foot apart. I mean, when you're driving down the road and you look at the, look at the lane somewhere, it, or the dashes, and you think they're like three feet apart, and you actually stop and look at next to them and they're 12 feet sure. between them or something, you just don't have any real perspective on it. Okay. So they're, they're as far apart as they need to be. I think these... Our top lines back here, four foot apart, four foot between them, um, and they're what twelve thousand volts. So they're as far as part. So it's only re the really big, tall ones with multiple rows that are on top of each other. Those monster transmission lines, they they would keep them as far apart as they need to be, and, and as ones far ones apart as even with wind or birds or whatever, they're not going to jump. <clears throat> um, but once it's dropped down all the way to one twenty, two forty to go to your house. They, they run tri triplex and they just twist together. They're not jumping through anything. Sure. Nothing else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.